Adam Nash, thank you so much for joining me back on Outlier Academy, this time for 20 Minute Playbook. I really appreciate the time. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, happy to be here. So we always start by asking uh, if you can share a recent fascination, something that's on your mind, something that you can't stop thinking about. What pops to mind for you? I mean, the most exciting thing for me right now is that technology is on the move again. Um, you know, after almost a half a century of stagnation, I'm just thrilled by the rapid progress in space exploration and what it'll mean for humanity to be multiplanetary. Um, and I'm also fascinated with the rapid progress now happening on artificial intelligence. Uh, mainly because of what it says about how much we understand or don't understand about ourselves, what intelligence even means, and even what consciousness is. Um, I just I think it's an amazing time to be in technology. There's yeah no there's clearly a lot of very interesting things that are very early and that are happening. Um, we ask uh, every guest as well, uh, you know, and especially for I think for you as we talked about in the last interview, you have just a prolific background. You've worked at many 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 different companies. Um, but one of the questions I always like to ask is what you think your superpowers are. So you've worked as an engineer, you've worked as a CEO, you've worked in a lot of different roles. What are your superpowers and how do those show up in those different roles? It's funny you ask that question. Um, I give a talk on product where I talk about the importance of knowing everyone's superpower. So I love this question. Um, but, you know, that actually is one of the things I focus on from a leadership perspective. Um, for many people who come from an engineering background, um, it can be difficult separating building the product you want to build from actually building the company itself, which is going to build and maintain that product indefinitely. And I've been fortunate enough in my career to have done almost every job there is around building software. Um, I've even repaired software, done customer service, sales, et cetera. And so for me, bringing people together, um, giving them the opportunity to do what they do well in their function and finding those ways of getting that team to work together to fulfill that vision to me is just something I care a lot about. And it's turned out to be something that I'm better at than, than most. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's, I mean, I think it's, uh, a lot of people, I'm not sure, view that as a skill. So I think it's also just interesting uh, because it's also very generalizable across any level of team to be able to do that. So I love that answer. Similarly, you know, you've built a lot of different companies. And, and one of the questions I like to ask is if you could distill down your principles uh, to, to how to build a company, how to build a team into just a few words, what that would be. What are some of those core principles you try to bring to each company that you create? From my perspective, the hardest thing about company building is prioritization and phasing. You, you just can't do it all at once. And I feel like companies waste way too much energy debating whether an idea is a good idea or a bad idea. Most of the ideas that come out from smart people tend to be good ideas, but they may not be the right thing to do now. And so being brutal about prioritization and focusing on what's the problem we're trying to solve now, what's the next phase that's not just venture financing. That actually turns out to be how you run a product roadmap, how you think about building a company. Um, and so, yeah, that's usually the advice I give founders there. So th think sequentially and, and spend, it sounds like, just as much time thinking about sequencing as thinking about ideas. Try to pair yeah, it, brutal prioritization, right? If you can yeah. only do three things, what do you do today, this week, this month? Yes. Um, that usually is the guide to focusing and taking it one step at a time because you can't build a company all at once. It wouldn't be possible. Yeah. One of the favorite questions I uh, read recently uh, that I, I'm starting to try to think about in my head a little bit more often is, um, and I think it was, um, gosh, Frank Slootman has this in his book, Amp It Up, where one of the questions he likes to ask his team members is, if there's only one thing that you could work on for the rest of the year, what would that one thing be and why? And it seems like, again, it's a good way of forcing that brutal prioritization that you talk about, which is very needed, <laughs> especially if you have an ambitious, uh, you know, vision that you're trying to bring into reality. I, I, one of the questions I always like to ask is around, um, what advice you would give to your younger self. So, you know, in a situation where you could go back in time, some sort of magical technology has been invented. <laughs> you could whisper some words, of wisdom, uh, you know, words of advice, a reminder into your ear. Is there anything you would go back and tell your younger self? You are going to hate my answer to this question. <laughs> um, I would not. I would not. I, I've, um, as too much of a sci-fi fan uh, and probably thought too much about this, um, I have four children I love. I would not do a single thing to my timeline to risk some adverse situation with my children, et cetera. Because it so, all worked out perfectly. <laughs> uh, it didn't work out perfectly. I just, I wouldn't want to be the cause of yeah. something negative. 
Yeah. So um, I know that's not the answer you're looking for, but it's uh, it's how I feel. No, no, no. That's as good as answer as any. I mean, I and and I appreciate that answer. Um, you know, similarly, well, in the last interview that we did, the kind of long form interview around Daffy, uh, we talked about someone that you've had the opportunity to work with uh, pretty closely, Clayton Christensen, being a really you know important kind of mentor and figure in your life. Um, it, it could be Clayton, could be others. What is a mentor figure that comes to mind uh, and shaped your approach to business and leadership? And are there any favorite anecdotes, stories, quotes that uh, that you remember distinctly from them? Well, actually, this was a little simple for me. I, I have had the privilege of working with some incredible people in my career. Um, it's probably unfair to, to pick any one because um, I've learned different things from different people. Um, but one of the most influential was actually Reid Hoffman, who's a uh, founder, um, was the head of LinkedIn, now on the board of Microsoft, etc. Um, but I spent so much time at LinkedIn and so much time with Reid internalizing how he thought about entrepreneurship and building companies and solving problems. And you know, with my background, I, I came at every problem before I met Reed as purely a knowledge problem, right? Do the research, figure it out. How smart are you? How much time you spend on it? And Reed really taught me that most problems are actually better approached as people problems, right? Who in your network, um, who is actually the right person to ask this question, who's already spent a lot of time, um, and then actually making sure that you have the relationships and network to lean on that. So, I mean, a lot of that obviously went into his vision for LinkedIn. Um, but for me, it affected how I get things done. I mean, even to this day at Daffy, you know, with employees, et cetera, um, sometimes it's great to have the answer at, at your fingertips because you've been asked the question before. But usually the right answer is to find the current expert and get their opinion on the topic. I love that reframing of the question as well, too, and focusing on it's almost right question to right person and making sure that you're picking that right person, uh, which is, yeah, a, a lovely principle. Um, what is a book article or paper that you love that you think more people should read? Well, you did mention Clay Christensen earlier, and I will say not enough people have read Innovator's Dilemma. I think too many people have read summaries of it, snapshots of it, presentations. They use that word disruption. It's not a very long book, and it's not actually that complicated. And while some of the technology examples might seem dated, um, I believe that if more people accepted a world where their competitors are not slow and foolish. They're smart and ambitious. And by the way, they have ample resources. And going into that competition, knowing that that's true and knowing that your only advantages are that their success is a trap. It leads them to focus on different customers and different problems than you as a startup, as an individual have the ability to do. And so I, I really do wish more people actually spent the time to read that book and actually internalize what it means to be competitive in the modern world of business, that it isn't a trick, um, but actually it's, it, it is very competitive, but their success opens up opportunity every day for new companies and new products to get built. Yeah. Well, I know as well, too, you know, and we talked about this a little bit before we recorded, just this idea, because I think it speaks to that, that there is, you know, with every successful technology creates opportunities for subsequent technologies. And just this idea that so much of progress is this endless waves of technology, which I know is something that you've thought about a lot and that you identify with. Talk about that idea and why you think that's so important. I do think there are different motions in innovation, and I think there's different roles for different people in that, right? Like, so I came from a, you know, more academic background, right? obviously in academia, there's an entire ideal about just pushing the envelope, right? This is what the entire doctoral process is about, right? Pushing the envelope of human knowledge forward. Um, but usually that ends up being fairly incremental, which is really valuable. Um, but there's also value for interdisciplinary innovation, where you take insight from one field to another. And that role usually can't be played by foremost experts in the area because they've gone so deep in one area, it's hard for them to be that deep in multiple areas. And so I'm a big believer in interdisciplinary innovation. And then, of course, there's that radical thinking of could we reframe the problem a different way? I mean, I usually joke, you asked me earlier about superpowers, but um, one of the reasons I think I got into product is that as a function, product managers have a unique ability and license to reframe problems. And one of the first things you learn in computer science is how you frame a problem is, is more than half of the process of solving that problem. And so, you know, how you frame as a leader the problem for your team, not just timing, not just metrics, 
But how to think about the problem, I think, is amazingly important in how we keep pushing the envelope forward and making better, better products and services for people. Yeah, so well said. Two final questions. First one, what tiny habit or practice has had the biggest positive impact on your life? Yeah, so um, so not surprisingly, um, like a lot of people in Silicon Valley, I have my fingers in too many things. Uh, <laughs> I have angel investing, I have a class, you know, all these things. And it's because I love diving into things and, and doing things. Uh, but the problem is it can leave you a little scatterbrained. Right. Like there's a little bit of this, you know, lack of prioritization, which is ironic for a product person. And so one of the habits actually started at uh, Wealthfront, you know, at Wealthfront, it turns out parking in Palo Alto is a disaster. It just really is. It took, it took months to get a permit. And so I'd have to park off in the neighborhood and walk to the office for about 15 minutes every morning. But just that time in the morning became an important tiny habit of if I only get three things done today, what are those three things? right? Just knowing for yourself that prioritization means that you can go into a day and do hundreds of things. But if you can't, and you only have time for a few, that you were intentional about it, right? It was a choice. Even if it was the wrong choice, it was a choice. And you can always revisit why you made that choice, etc. But for me, that tiny habit of every morning, and sometimes the night before, if it's going to be an early morning, of just knowing what are the three most important things you're going to get done the next day, I find amazingly valuable as a leader. And for someone in technology who could be inundated with lots of inputs and requests, um, it helps you also say no uh, when you need to. Totally. And it gets you in proactive mode as opposed to reactive mode, which is, you know, the thing I think everybody observes as you become more successful, uh, you get more opportunities to do things. It's just so easy for all of your life to become a reaction to (laughs) everything else in your life. The meetings, the emails, you know, the task I got from this meeting before I get to that next meeting. Um, And uh, yeah, I mean, it's something I've tried to focus on is just how can I live a more proactive life in those little moments like that are insanely helpful. (laughs) Last question, what is your favorite way to waste an hour? We talked about you've got your hands in lots of pots, so there's potentially a lot of places you could, you could, uh, you know, spend time. What guilty pleasure do you wish you had more time for? Well, I mean, I know you've been following me on Twitter for a long time, so you probably know the answer here, but (laughs) I love gardening. I think it's a wonderful thing. Um, Always love gardening. If If you catch me on Sunday, I spend an hour or two every Sunday in the garden, um, there's something very peaceful and methodical about investing your time with living things and over weeks and months being rewarded with kind of abundance, you know, from nature. I, I think it's a form of delayed gratification. I, I think it's also a lesson in humility about what is and isn't under your control. But yeah, if you want to know my guilty pleasure, take, taking an hour to walk outside, look at the plants, what's doing well, what's not doing well little nudge, little things here and there. Like to me, that that is just, you know, rejuvenation for the whole week. And you're totally right because it is, I think it's the banner on the top of your Twitter profile is a photo of your garden, <laughs> I'm guessing in your backyard. It's funny. Um, I get a lot of people who tell me on Twitter, like Adam, yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk about the finance stuff, tech, it's great. I just, I follow you for the garden. <laughs> so many people tell me like, I follow you for your garden, uh, but that's fine. Um, I, I think it's wonderful. And I, I actually wish more people um, had the opportunity to be in touch with kind of, that same feeling of gratification of helping things grow. I totally agree. It's a, it's a totally different modality that I think a lot of people have somewhat forgotten. Well, Adam, this has been incredible. Uh, for anyone listening, you can follow Adam. We just talked about his Twitter at Adam Nash on Twitter. Highly recommend that you follow Adam. Um, and Adam's been building an incredible company called Daffy. You can find their app. It's a very easy way for anyone to be able to give, to, to set a goal for giving, to find causes that you care about and be able to give really easily. Uh, you can download that at the App Store uh, by searching for Daffy. And you can also go to daffy.org. Thank you so much for the time, Adam. Uh, I've loved having you on. Thank you.